This is John, who provides an example of a capacity limitation during the back squat. As you can see here, if we pause at his full depth, he's not quite reaching parallel, and um, he stops the uh, squat with his hips quite far above his knees. We can also see here that the line of his tibia is not parallel to the line of his spine, um, which would be considered optimal for balancing the forces during this movement. There are numerous things that can cause this movement pattern to occur, and in some cases it is linked to motor control. However, in this example, when we test his ankle range movement using the knee to wall test, we can see that he is restricted in his ankle dorsiflexion uh, bilaterally. It's suggested that if the knee can reach the wall approximately three to four inches um, away, which is approximately a fist's distance, that will give adequate ankle dorsiflexion in order to reach full depth in the squat. But as you can see with John here, he's unable to achieve that and actually has to bring his toes very close to the wall in order for his knee to be able to make contact without the heel lifting from the floor. Um, if the tibia is unable to translate forward and it stays closer to vertical on the descent during the squat, it can cause the center of mass to be shifted backwards towards the heels, which in turn can leave the subject off balance and give the sensation or fear of falling backwards, which would naturally cause him to stop moving um, and make him think he's reached full depth. So there are a couple of things we can do to help improve his movement pattern here. Initially, a joint mobilisation technique of the Taylor crural joint to help increase his dorsiflexion range. And following this, we need to strengthen within that new range of movement, which we can do so by doing some eccentric loading of the gastrocnemius and soleus complex. Secondly, if we had a slight raise to his heels here for the duration of the squat, uh, which could also be achieved with a weightlifting shoe, we can see that he's now able to reach a much lower depth um, and he's now able to hit parallel in comparison to when he does it with a flat foot, as you can see here. This allows him to perform a more optimal movement pattern and he's now able to start developing strength in this new desirable range of movement. So this is Jack, um, who demonstrates an example of having developed a non-optimal movement pattern during the back squat. Um, he doesn't move too far away from the technical model. However, if we slow it down here, you can see that his lumbar spine moves into flexion and he just loses his lordotic curve as he hits full depth. So one explanation for this is due to connective tissue tightness of his hip flexors, um, as you can see here when tested with the Thomas test. Um, suggesting that it would be a capacity issue. Um, that said though, when we assess his, mov his movement pattern on all fours, we can see that he does actually have the ability to get his hips below parallel before the spinal flexion starts to occur. So actually, this is an example of where skills and capacities are interlinked. Um, on talking with Jack regarding the depth of his squat, he mentioned that he tends to uh, use the bounce at the bottom in order to help him get up, um, particularly when the weight gets very heavy. So this means that he could have de uh, developed this movement pattern um, actually from allowing himself to go to a depth where the hip flexor tightness begins to affect his lordotic position. And obviously this is not desirable um, because of the forces that then get placed through the lumbar discs of the spine, uh, putting him at very high risk of injury. So there are a couple of things we can do to help uh, improve this movement pattern. Initially, he would probably benefit from working on his hip flexor mobility uh, by using techniques such as uh, the front foot elevated split squat in order to eccentrically load the tissue and create length under tension. Secondly, uh, he'd benefit from working on some controlled um, descent tempo squats with a pause at the bottom, and this would create a better position awareness and spinal stability at the bottom of his squat rather than bouncing out of the position and allowing the spine to move into flexion, uh, particularly under high speeds, as this is what tends to be the bigger um, influence of injury risk. So here we have Ian, um, who's only recently learned how to snatch, and he's only actually completed this movement a handful of times. So the first thing we can see here for Ian's setup position um, are a number of deviations away from the technical model. His knees are dropping in slightly, um, and his chest is very low, it's almost folding over the bar. And if you look from the side, um, you can see he's in a lumbar flexed position, which we don't want for both um, efficiency purposes, but also for injury prevention to the lumbar discs. So he would benefit here from being cued to push his knees out slightly um, and rotate the creases of his elbows forwards or uh, break the bar 
as some people uh, tend to use. Um, also, just gently just squeeze his shoulder blades together, um, and this would help him sit more upright um, and place his lumbar spine in a more neutral position, um, as well as helping him to start with more tension and core stability. Um, but he would still be able to get his shoulders over the bar where they need to be. So from this anterior angle we can see that he has got quite good timing for his second pull and he is fully extended before he begins to bend his elbows. Um, for a novice this movement pattern is actually pretty good. However when we look at his movement from the side um, and if we track his barbell path here uh, we can see that he tends to overextend his back during that second phase and the bar travels quite far forwards out in front of him. Now whilst some horizontal displacement of the barbell is essential for optimal lifting technique, it's suggested that this should be minimal because the application of horizontal forces can then reduce the stability in the catch. We can see here how Ian has to jump forwards in order to catch the bar and in doing so he lands on his toes which makes him very unstable at the bottom. So ideally he needs to catch with the weight towards the rear of the foot but with the toes still in contact with the floor. As the weight gets heavier now you can see how this movement pattern is becoming a hindrance because he's unable to catch it in the full overhead squat position. Um, this highlights that it's a lack of skill in this area and he needs to practice jumping straight up with the bar rather than incorporating that backwards lean. One drill that would help him practice developing stability in the catch would be the snatch balance. When we got him to do some here, you can see that with no overextension of the spine, he catches it solid at the bottom with both heel and toe contact on the floor, um, which is ideal, and he has no wobbling or instability now at the bottom. So this is Rich, who's had a lot more practice in this movement and has been performing it for a number of years now. So when we look at his starting position, we can see he is much closer to the technical model, particularly regarding the position of his spine, which we can see from the side here. He does tend to drive his knees quite far um, out, which could be due to tightness of his glute muscles, so he could be cued here to keep his big toes pressed into the floor, uh, just to ensure he doesn't roll out onto the outside of his foot. So when we look at Rich's snatch from the front, we can see that he does not reach full extension before he begins to pull the bar and flex his elbows, um, and this is more prominent on his left hand side. However, unlike Ian, he explodes directly upwards and he's pretty good at keeping the bar close to his torso. So the barbell path is a much straighter line and it doesn't translate forwards quite as far. This means he's able to catch it in a much stronger position at the bottom without having to jump too far forwards to meet the bar. Uh, this would suggest he has better motor control pattern of performing this movement. Uh, that said, when we look from the front again, we can see that his left shoulder drops significantly in comparison to the right when he catches the bar, and that does affect his stability on the catch. Uh, and we can see he struggles to catch it in a full overhead squat position. On talking with Rich, it became apparent that he's previously injured that left shoulder. Uh, when we look at his range of movement using the Apley scratch test, we can see that he has a slightly increased range of movement on his left side compared to his right. Um, it would need a lot more further investigation to support this theory, but it would suggest there's an element of instability on that left-hand side. It could be that he's compensating during his pull by overusing his biceps rather than relying on the balance between the trapezius, deltoid, lats and the rotator cuff muscles. And therefore he's developed this non-optimal motor control pattern due to that insufficient capacity regarding muscle strength on that left side. So initially he would most likely benefit from some rehabilitation to help stabilise that left shoulder initially. Um, one exercise we can do is an inverted uh, kettlebell hold. Um, once that is corrected he'd then need to address the, mo the motor control pattern and relearn the skill of that second pull. Uh, one exercise would be the high hang snatch which would benefit that. So he can practice hitting that triple extension of the lower limb whilst maintaining a full elbow extension before he begins to pull the bar upwards. So in summary, this vlog demonstrates how non-optimal movement patterns can occur in weight room activities from either a lack of skill in the execution of the movement and sometimes through lack of capacities. We can also see how these two things can link and impact one another. Sometimes a lack of capacity alone can mean our ability to execute the skill optimally is hindered. And in comparison, we can see how sometimes poor execution of a skill can lead to non-optimal movement patterns, thus hindering our capacity to achieve the desired criteria of a given task. 
This in turn can lead to developing insufficiencies such as muscular tightness um, and or weakness from reinforcing these poor motor control patterns and increasing the risk of injury as well as limiting an athlete's true ability.